Whew. I don't know if you felt it, but I walked into this room. Boy, I was hit by a lot of energy. <laughs> I don't know if you're feeling it or not. Because I don't need it. The speaker doesn't need it. <laughs> you know. But that's what my daughter was saying. Look at all the energy we've been generating here this whole weekend. And so I guess it's accumulating. When I walked in, I could feel it through my arms and everything. But I don't need it, so I need to get it out of here. <laughs> so <laughs> off of me anyway, it can affect you guys. <sighs> okay, when I'm doing my sessions, I have an office over in Huntsville, and there's an awful lot of energy that accumulates in that office. You won't believe it. And uh, there are all kinds of strange things happen in there because of the energy. And I always say, oh, it's just them. You know, my little gremlins that like to play. <laughs> so it's what it is here. It's an accumulation of energy, but it's a positive energy anyway. But sometimes when I'm speaking somewhere, I can feel it rolling off of the audience. <sighs> okay, well, I hope you're enjoying the conference. Yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. We have a lot of good speakers and a lot of good authors. Okay. Now I'm going to be, oh, so I'm trying to figure out how to start on all of this. Uh, most of you know about my work and what I do, but I do want to give a little bit of explanation on this part that I keep referring to they, so most of those who don't know will understand what I'm talking about. But I've been doing the hypnosis for 40 years, and I've been doing the past life uh, sessions and regressions for 30 years. So I do the therapy and the counseling. People come to the world, that little town in Huntsville, to have a session. So it just keeps growing and growing. But during that 30 years, I developed my own technique that is not like any other hypnosis technique out there. And that's what I'm teaching now all over the world because it is uh, very dynamic and powerful. But what I learned when I was putting this together and it evolved, I found out how to contact this part that is so powerful. And that's the one that I get the information from. Now, most uh, hypnotists do past life regressions. That's all they do. It just go through a past life and that's it. And a lot of times the client, when they leave, they'll say, well, it was interesting, ancient Greece, ancient Egypt, but what does it have to do with my life now? A lot of hypnotists don't know how to tie it together and how to take it further. So when I do my work, the past life regression is the tip of the iceberg. That's just the very beginning because there's so much more you can find out. So I found a way to contact what I call the subconscious. But it's not the subconscious the way the psychiatrists define it. Uh, and I've had arguments with uh, psychiatrists that have taken my class about this because they don't agree with me. But the, the, uh, the subconscious the way the psychiatrists define it, that to me is a childish part of the mind. And you can use it for habits, stop smoking, lose weight, but it does not have the knowledge of this part that I found. The part I work with that I call the subconscious, you may want to define it as the oversoul, the higher self, the higher consciousness. But it is so big and so huge that it has the answers to everything. Why not work with that part? Because it is so powerful. I call it the subconscious. They said, they don't care. They said, we'll work with you no matter what you call us. But I call it that part. Some of my students said they began calling it the higher self, which doesn't make any difference. It works. But that's the one that I call in when I'm doing the instantaneous healings. And also, it solves the person's problems. But the interesting thing that has happened with this, and I call it them, because they refer to themselves as a group, but it is a very powerful group. But it's amazing that it is so huge, but it is cares very much about each individual person. And that's why when I do the session, it has so much love for the person I'm working with that that is, 
it's, it's beyond description. But it's hard to explain because it's beyond our way of, of defining things. So uh, when, when I'm contacting this part, one time I asked them, well, who are you? Because they referred to themselves as a group. And they said, we are the collective. And I said, that sounds like the Borg on Star Trek. <laughs> But it is such a powerful group that the amazing thing about it is it comes through everybody I work with. All over the world, it doesn't make any difference. It's always the same. It's always the same definitions. It always uses the same terminology, the way it speaks. It's always the same, I don't want to say entity, it's too bigger than that. But people taken my class and said, if had it happened, they'll say, yeah, I contacted the subconscious, and I have to say with a capital S, because it is so powerful when it comes through. But how can you explain it? It comes through everybody I work with, and nobody knows what I'm looking for. They come to me with problems, and I'm helping them with that. But it's always the same voice, the same definitions, the same terminology, doesn't make any difference where I speak to them anywhere in the world. And as part of this, this is how I get my information that I write about. A lot of times it is the entire session. They will turn into the part I need. But a lot of times toward the end of the session, and I can be in England having a session. Toward the end of the session, this voice will come through. They never interrupt the therapy, but toward the end, it'll come through and say, Dolores, this is the next piece of information you need for your next book. And they'll start giving me a theory that I haven't even heard of before. And I'll say, okay. <laughs> and then a couple of weeks later, I'll be back in the States doing somebody else. It'll happen again. And they give me more information about the theory they've just given me. So it's like a continuing thing. And some of these people will go home and they'll uh, email me or call me and they'll say, what was that voice at the end of the tape? Because it definitely wasn't them. So I call them they because they have become so powerful in my life. And it's not channeling because this is something much bigger than that. that because it's not coming through one person, it's coming through many, many people. So that's what my books, especially the new ones now, the Convoluted Universe series, are coming from the fact that accumulation of the material that they keep giving me. And every time I think I've got it all, there's nothing more they can possibly tell me. Something new comes out through somebody else, and I'm off on another theory. Uh, that's how the Convoluted Universe material came about, because when I was doing... The custodians, that was my 20 years of working with the UFOs and the abduction cases. And the voices began to come through then, but those were the ETs were giving me information about their planets, about how their ships operated, and uh, why they were coming. This is one of the reasons that I did want to uh, print Don's books, because he was validating all the things that I've written about that I found this way. And to me, that shows there's something to it if it's coming from other directions, the same material. Because they gave me the same story of the seeding of the planet Earth, how life began, how they've been taking care of us since the beginning of time. But it began to go in different directions, away from UFOs and abductions, and began to get into complicated metaphysics. That's when I started writing the Convoluted Universe series. But what I'm getting now... I could never have understood 30 years ago when I started out. I've been evolving and growing the whole time. I've written 15 books now, and some people say they want to read the books in the order I wrote them so they can see how I evolved and how I changed as I went along. Because I began to, in the very beginning 30 years ago with this reincarnation, I thought I had all the answers, you know. <laughs> I figured I knew it all. You know, I knew how reincarnation works. I was thinking of it in the linear fashion. And I thought I had it all figured out. But then they began coming up with these other theories. And I said, wait a minute. 
The first one was the imprinting theory. I'm not going to go into a lot of this because I've talked for days on this, these things, and you can see why. But every came up with a theory that I'd never heard of, and it disrupted my belief system. Like, wait a minute, guys, you know, I've got this all figured out. Now you're throwing something else in here that doesn't go according with what I believe and what I thought I've learned. And it really bothered me. But then I got to thinking, if I wasn't open to new ideas and asking questions and learning something else, then I was no better than the church that said, believe this, don't ask any for anything else, don't try to question. So I began looking at these new ideas they were presenting to me and trying to figure them out, and it began to make sense. So after that, then I get another little piece. They never overwhelm you. Even my clients, they won't overwhelm you. It's like all these years they've been giving me little spoonfuls of information. Here's another piece. Digest this, then we'll give you a little piece more. And I think that's a wise thing to do. Otherwise, I would have been overwhelmed. I would have thrown it all away. And I said, no, I don't understand it. Uh, I'm not going to work with it. And that's what would have happened. I had a client who came to me. Everyone who comes to see me, their main question is they want to know what's their purpose. They want to know what they're here for. What are they supposed to be doing with their life? That's the main question. The subconscious, them, you know who I'm talking about, they said... They can tell you if it's appropriate. Because suppose somebody knew their purpose before it was time. You weren't ready to hear it. If you were told too soon, well then, the person would say, oh, that's the last thing I'd ever want to do. I'm not going to do that. And you'd put blocks in your way, and you would sabotage it. So they know. So I had this man. One of the questions he wanted to know was, what was his purpose? Why was he here? They said, we can't tell you, it's not time. But they said, oh, we wish we could because you don't know what we see. <laughs> but they said, consider he is where you were 20 years ago. You don't give a baby a three-course meal. You start a baby out on milk, cereal, crushed vegetables. You don't give them a steak. So that's the same idea you have to evolve at the stage your mind is. And so after that, I began to understand I could not have handled the stake that I'm getting now 30 years ago. I would have blown my mind. I would have just said, nope, it's too complicated. I don't want anything to do with it. So over the years, they have been giving me more and more complicated information. And as soon as I understand it, digest it, then they come up with another one. And it's been that way now, especially when I, as I go through the Convoluted Universe series. And those of you who have read the last one, I just finally got it out in February. I thought the book was finished when I got to the part about the final solution. But my daughter was saying, no, we don't want to end it on a negative note. So I went to Montreal a month later. They came through blasting at me. This is the way it should end. This is a new theory, a totally new theory. And here I thought I'd had all the theories they could come up with. And they began telling me something that I'd never heard of before. And I said, I don't understand it. They said, all right, then we stop right here. Do you digest it and understand it? But just be aware there is more. So I end the book with that. There is more. <laughs> So there will be more books because there's still more information that I can't understand. They think it's time now that people begin to broaden their minds, begin to think, begin to come up with ideas we've never even thought of before. They said we will never have all of the information. It's impossible. They told me one time, all of your questions will never be answered because some information is as poison versus medicine. It's not our brains, it's our minds. Our minds don't have the concepts to understand the totality of it all. So even when they're telling me things, they'll say, well, this is the best we can explain it in your language, with your words and your vocabulary. 
but it's just a very tiny part of what the whole picture and the concept is. But we're beginning to get more and more, and I think we're beginning to open up our minds more and more to what's really it's all about. We're, that's why we're moving into this whole new earth, and that's what I'm going to be speaking about. Things are changing. This is a very exciting time to be living. But I can see how I have evolved over the 30 years, and I don't know you. I think you're doing the same thing. Um, the church definitely doesn't have the answers anymore, and science doesn't have the answers. We're proceeding beyond that. I had a man who read Convoluted 3, and he emailed me, and he said he heard me speak at the Laughlin UFO conference in February. And he said, oh, he didn't believe any of it. It was a bunch of bunk. But he went and got the book. And then he's, he was a physicist, a scientist. So he emailed me, and he said, this opens up a whole new way to look at science. It could change science totally. And he said, I'm going to go out there and tell my other scientists what I have found. But first I have to know, did you make this up? <laughs> Is this fiction before I go out on the limb? And I, I wrote, I get 400 emails a day, but I figured I had to answer that one. So I said, no, I could not make this stuff up. There's no way. This is beyond me. I'm the reporter, the investigator, the accumulator of lost knowledge. I just put it out there. But no, there's no way I could make it up. What they feel ready to give me, I just write about it and try my best to understand it so I can lecture about it. And that's as far as I can go. But they say it is changing the way the scientists are even beginning to look at our reality. So there's a lot more going on than I realize. In me, like I said, I'm just a reporter. A lot of it hasn't really even sunk in. Because I can't remember all the stuff I write. The last book was 700 pages. The two before that was 600. I pulled out enough material that I have enough for a fourth volume. And even though they told me that was the end of that one, about two months after I got the book out, it began coming through again for the people I work with. And I've got 25 tapes at home I have to transcribe. So there's going to be more co in the convoluted series. I've already pulled out all the information about UFOs. I've been taking that out of the last three books because even that is going in a different direction, a different way of understanding a totally new perspective. So I'm going to put that in a separate book. I'm working on three more books right now, anyway. But I was talking to my friend Lou Farish, who has been helping me through all the UFO uh, cases all the last 20 years, and I told him, uh, it's going a different way. And he says, why don't you call it convoluted UFOs? <laughs> well, I thought he was joking, but people said, it's not a bad title because it's, it's going to a different direction to look at it from a different way. So anyway, it's, I've still got lots of material. I'm going to still be writing a lot more books, and more and more is coming from everywhere I go. So, okay, I'm trying to think where to begin. I did a conference. I spoke at a conference a couple of months ago in Kansas. They gave me an hour. They said, we want you to tell all about everything you've written about. <laughs> And everything in the Convoluted Universe series in one hour, but save 15 minutes of it for questions. <laughs> and I thought, oh my gosh, you don't have no idea the amount of material. <laughs> so when I got up there, I felt like I was running a race. I'm a little more relaxed right now, but I felt like I had to cram an awful lot of material into that 45 minutes and still have enough for questions. So I'm slowing it down a little bit here so I can cover the same information. Okay. Um, one strange thing that has been happening to me in the last several years is an evolution in my work. All of these 30 years, with the past life regressions, the past life therapy, I've been focusing on the past lives because that's where the answers are. The person has problems in this lifetime, physical, uh, family, whatever it is, it normally goes back to the past life. So in my technique, I take them back to the most appropriate past life 
to explain what's going on in the present lifetime. Once they find it, the problem goes away. So it's way it's been. I've been doing this the whole time. <laughs> now suddenly, strange things are happening. And they come through and take over the session. They'll say, past lives are no longer important. You must focus on now and moving forward. There's a whole lot of strange things that are happening. Uh, what I'm finding now, maybe nine out of the ten cases I might see in a couple of weeks will not go to past lives. They'll go somewhere else, and I'm going to explain what that's all about. The ones I'm finding that are still going to past lives still have karma to work out. They've still got problems with people in their family or something they haven't worked out yet. The other ones they said have already been there, done that. It's not, it's no, no, uh, not no any sense to focus on that anymore, like you did in Maryland's. See, you weren't focusing on a past life. You're clearing up stuff now. This is what they were saying. You've got to work on the karma now and get it out of your life, get rid of it. And we're not focusing on what we've already done. They said it might be interesting, curious, but it has no effect on where we're going. That it's like kindergarten stuff. We have to focus on this life, getting it straightened out, because we're moving into something that is tre very tremendous. So I've noticed, and I wrote a lot about it in the third book, the people are going to several other places. Many of them, instead of going to past lives, are returning to God. Are they called the source? They're going back to where they all started from. They're going back to the beginning instead of going into other lives. And it's happening more and more. Other ones are going to lives when they were on other planets, on spaceships, or other dimensions, or when they were energy beings. And many of them have never been on Earth before. This is their first time. And a fascinating thing about this is all of them, even whenever they go back to the God source, uh, when I say, well, why did you come? You're, I know you're talking to somebody who's here. You know, why are, did you decide to come to Earth? Every one of them, even the ETs, whatever it is, will all say, we heard the call and we volunteered to come. Because this is what I've been told. Uh, well, the ETs, you know, they have been around forever. They've been taking care of us forever. So I've never found any negativity in this because they are the ones who seeded the planet Earth. They're the ones who created us, just as Don Shorn was talking about. They've been taking care of us since the beginning of time. They have been here teaching us things through thousands and thousands of years. They are here to protect us. So they've been watching us all that time. So what happened was, whenever we had the atomic bomb explosions at the end of the 1940s and the beginning of the 50s, you remember there was a big influx of UFO activity at that time. They said it's because when we, sh we shot off the U um, atomic bombs, it got their attention. <laughs> You know, most of the time, they're not here all the time. They come and go. But when this happened, the atomic bomb was shot off. They said, oh, my gosh, what are those kids up to now? <laughs> and so they are come to watch and find out what are we playing with. And they were not happy because they said, these kids are fooling around with something they don't know how to handle, something that's totally beyond their ability to control. Because they know where we are. We can't even take care of ourselves. That They know we've been on this wheel of karma for generations and generations and generations, repeating the same karma over and over again. Instead of getting off of it and learning your lessons and going higher, we keep coming back to the same, same, uh, same mess, the same people again and again because we haven't got it figured out. And the whole world is that way. And here we're right, we just finished a war. We were in the middle of violence. We hadn't learned anything yet. Now we go shooting off atomic bombs. They said if they can't even take care of themselves, how are they going to handle something like this? So they were really worried about it. So that's when 
they began monitoring us to see what we're going to be doing with this. And they don't like it. They're very unhappy with what we're doing. And they said, we have to change. We can't allow this to go on because we could get to the point where we could destroy the world with what we were doing. And they said they can't allow that to happen. Now, the the divine directive is just like on Star Trek, that they cannot interfere. You cannot interfere with a developing civilization. They must, it's a planet of free will. They must make their messes, they must make their mistakes, and they just stand back and shake their heads. But they can't interfere because we have been given permission to do whatever we want. But if it gets to the point that we're going to blow up the world, they said it would send reverberations out through space, we would disrupt other civilizations that we're not even aware of. Not only in our galaxy, in our solar system, our universe, but also in other dimensions. Because the vibrations would be tremendous. You know what happened with the asteroid belt exploded. I've written about that with the destruction of the air on Mars. That, and they said Earth was hit many, many times with that. It would have been worse, but Earth was on the other side of the sun whenever the explosion occurred. Otherwise, we would have had more damage to Earth. But they can't have this happening. It affects too many other planets and other civilizations that we don't even know about in the other dimensions. They said it's like undeclared war on innocent people. So if that were to happen, then they would have to step in and stop us. They don't want to wait to that point, though, to get to that part. So they said, okay, what are you going to do? We can't just come down and say, hey, guys, this is stupid. You've got to stop it. That's against the divine directive. You can't just come in and make anybody do what, they're, what they should do. They have sense enough to do, but what they won't do. So they said they had meetings with the councils. What do we do now? This is a very dangerous situation. They came up with a plan, and I think it's ingenious, but they said, this one won't go against free will. We can't help from the outside. Why don't we help from the inside? That is not interference. So I said, what do you mean? They said, they, the call went out through the universes. Earth is in trouble. It needs help. Will you volunteer? Will you come and help? And all these people, when I speak to them, they said, we heard the call and we answered. And this means souls that have never been on earth before. And I'm getting more and more and more of these. This is their first time. They don't know this consciously, but it is the first time they've been here. And you can imagine someone coming from the source of total love, but only coming because they want to help Earth. But look at the mess they're coming into. And it takes a lot of courage to come down here and want to be involved in this. And I've taken them through the birth experience, and they were saying, my gosh, I didn't know what I was getting into. Because they feel the heaviness, the denseness of Earth and the, the body. And then they feel all of these emotions that are so complicated because they've not been exposed to them. They said when they volunteered, they had the big meetings, and they told them this is what it's going to be like. But they didn't really prepare them for what it was really like when they got down here. This is a a challenging planet. It's a very difficult planet to live on. I said the other day, we come here to learn emotions and limitations. But can you imagine souls that have never been exposed to any of that? So some of the ones that are coming direct from the source are having a very difficult time. And the other ones, the ones that are the ETs, these are very gentle people too. They've never been exposed to the, the violence and the, all of the emotions that are here on Earth. They're coming for the first time. So they're all having trouble with it, but they're here to help us. That's the idea. Bring in souls that are pure have never known the violence, have never accumulated the karma to help Earth get out of this mess. Now, the rest of us can help by getting rid of our karma, but we have more work to do. They're coming in to help this. I guess I should tell you about the three waves of the volunteers that I've found. 
Now I'm going to go into the new earth, but I think these things are important. And I found this over 30 years, and now it's, it's, it's speeding up, it's increasing. I think it's a clever plan, because they keep saying that we'll help you in spite of yourself from the inside. If you can get enough pure, innocent, good souls out there, they can counteract all of the negativity and the evil that's happening. It all goes back to love. Love is the strongest emotion there is. And that's what they're trying to install into all of us. So there's going to be a lot of confusion. But I found the three waves of people. The first ones are now in their 50s. If you read my book, Keepers of the Garden, that was my first exposure to one of these people. And it was the first time I'd ever had anyone go back to a lifetime where they were an an alien. They were an E.T. He said he had never lived on Earth before. And he told me what it was like on the other planets he lived on. And I'd never done it. And I'm sitting there thinking, what do you ask an an alien? I didn't know where to go in that book because of my first time to do it. And it was so difficult for him that he tried to commit suicide because it was like, I don't want to be here. I don't like the violence. Why are people so mean to each other? He couldn't understand it. And oh, uh, why are they always hurting each other? And it, it just didn't make sense. He said, this is not home. I want to go home. He didn't know where home was, but he knew it wasn't here. He had a wonderful family that loved him. He had a good job. But he just didn't like the negativity here. And in that book, that's how I found out, he was one, we took it back where he said he volunteered to come. And he's what I call the first wave. The first wave of people that volunteers have had the most difficulty. Now I'm finding them all over the world, and I put them into these different categories. Um, but it, they are around the age of 50 now. There may be some that are a little bit older, but this man, when I was first working with him, was only in his 30s. When that book began to be translated all over the world, it's now come out in Chinese, I was getting letters from everybody. They say, I thought I was the only one in the world that felt this way, that I didn't belong here, that this wasn't home. And he said, you don't know what it means to find there's other people out there who feel the same way. So now I'm finding them everywhere, and it's beginning to make sense to them. And in the new book, I have a whole chapter on the first-timers, but they're beginning to come out. But the first ones had the hardest time because they was new to them. It was difficult. Then I found the second wave, which are now, I think, in their 20s and 30s. They came after the first wave. They didn't have it as hard. They were called, when I do the sessions, they call them antennas, channels for energy. They call them generators. They're not here to do anything except be. And the energy flows through them that will be used to help the world. So it's a different type of person, the second one is. They aren't having this difficulty. They've adjusted beautifully. Many of them don't want children. And when I do the sessions, they said, we don't want children because children create karma. That would mean, (laughs) that would mean we'd have to keep coming back. We want to get in here, do our job, and get out. They don't want to be stuck here. They just want to do what they have to do and get out again. So they're just here. Most of these people live just very ordinary lives. They don't, don't make any waves, but they're the ones who are Uh, holding the energy that is going to change the world. They act as channels of um, antennas, they said, for the energy. They're very good people, very nonchalant. They aren't the ones that are having the trouble like the first wave trying to commit suicide. I asked them one time, why did the, the second wave didn't have as much trouble as the others? They said because the other ones were the way showers, the pioneers, the trailblazers. Somebody had to go before to set the path. And once the path was set, then the second ones come in. It was much easier to just fit right in and follow that. 
but they all are volunteers. The third wave you're all familiar with are the new children. Now they're called indigo children. I don't go along with that term and the other investigators I work with don't like that term either. Uh, Mary Wadwell in Australia that I work with, she calls them the new kids on the block. Now they're now, many of them are in their teens. I've spoken at conferences where they will have board, I mean panels of these young kids. They're like 13 and they explain the difficulties they're having with schools and the problems. And some of the people, the kids on those panels were from Indian tribes, they're from all over, all walks of life. They're coming in with everything in place. They are the hope of the world. They are the ones who will make the biggest changes. They're coming in with everything they need, and it's beautiful, it's fantastic. But of course, you know, people not understanding them, they're the ones that are causing the trouble. The teachers that don't understand them. And, uh, but they are the ones that have great knowledge. They have everything in place. Their DNA has already been changed to function in this new reality. We're the ones that have to catch up. But they're already here. And when I mean, I've talked to these children, they'll say the problem with the school is they don't need to be put on Ritalin. They definitely don't need to be put on any drugs at all. And that's what they say, don't do this to the children. But that they say, like they're bored is the main thing. They said the teacher gives them a problem. They tell them the answer. The teacher says, how did you find the answer? Show me your steps. They say, I know it. But show me how you did it. But I already know the answer. And then there'll be other things, and they'll say, they said they will repeat it again and again and again. They said, I got it the first time. Why don't they just drop it? So this is part of why they are disruptive in the class is because they're bored. Because they're already learning much faster than the other kids. So they need to have a whole new system. In some of these conferences, they're trying to educate the educators so that they will be able to help with these children. So I asked them, what can we do with these children to help? They said, give them challenges. So if the people, the teachers would know this, just to give them something to do outside of the class. If they've already finished their other thing they were working on, give them something else. Even if you give them something to tear apart and put back together again, it gives them something to focus on, something different, a challenge. And that's the way to approach it, not by sedating them and putting them on drugs and treating them as different, because these are the ones who will help change the world. But I found these three waves of volunteers that have come in. And I think you'll recognize a lot of these. A lot of us, the rest of us, are still catching up because we have to get rid of the karma. But they're here to definitely help. But they're having a very difficult time, especially the first wave, because it's not easy to be here. But they did volunteer to come in and help. Um, I guess I should probably bring up one more thing that's happening. I'm trying to keep this in order. Another amazing thing that has happened in my work, we have the people coming in. I said the volunteers, they're volunteered to come in. Then something else was happening. Now that we're getting close to the time of the new earth, it's a little late to wait for them to come in as babies, have to grow up. So they have had another phenomenon that's happening that is a first, that first I've heard of anyway. They said, suppose somebody's going through a near-death experience, and they won't really want to go. You know, they had the one case where the mother had died and the daughter wanted to go on with her. And so they said, okay, you can go if you want to. But it's not a walk-in. A walk-in is a totally different thing. They have a volunteer who wants to come, and they said, all right, you can go in. Their soul never been on Earth before. You can go in. But they make an agreement with the other person. You want to go, you can go on. But they enter the body of someone who later will say, I've had a near-death experience. They don't realize they really did die. This new soul came in. It's a little complicated to understand. 
But they said they have two minutes to get in, and that's it. After the old soul leaves, the new one has to get in there within two minutes. Otherwise, the body can't be activated and can't continue on with what it's doing. Because in the cases I'm finding like like this, the person themselves does not know any of this. They discontinue on their own life. If you try to take them into a past life, it doesn't work. They go back to the point that this soul entered the body. And that's what it'll tell me. Well, we had two minutes to get in here while the old one left, and they said they're perfectly happy over there where they wanted to go. There's nothing wrong with it. It's not like a suicide, and it definitely isn't a walk-in. It's a whole different perspective. So this is something new that I'm finding. And there have been other cases. There, say sometimes, I'm kind of getting off in a lot of this, but um, another direction. Sometimes these new souls that are coming in, their energy is so strong that it's difficult to come into the body of a baby because it doesn't match. Are you, anybody, are you following me with all this? I'm afraid I don't want to get over your head. <laughs> okay. Uh, the energy is different. The frequencies and vibrations are different than the human body is coming through. So sometimes when they try to come in, it's too strong for the developing fetus, and it will end up in an abortion because they, you, the, the mother can't handle it. It's just too much energy. The frequencies don't match. So they'll say, okay, we've got to do it again. We have to adjust some of these frequencies. Otherwise, it won't work. It would harm, harm the mother. And the baby couldn't survive. So a lot of times they will wait until the baby is born, and then they can make the adjustments outside of it as the soul is entering at the moment of birth. So they are finding a lot of ways to do this. And these people grow up being different. They're, they're unusual. They're not your normal people that we're used to. But they're here to help, and it's very important and very powerful that they be here at this time. So this is some of the stuff I'm finding that did not go along with what I was learning in the beginning of my work. It just keeps evolving and evolving and changing. Now, uh, it is important, I think, that I do explain about God, about the God source. I've got a whole section, and I first found out about it in, uh, I think it was Convoluted One, is the first time I had somebody go back to where they were with God. And now it's coming up so much that I've got a whole section about it. Well, what is God? What is the God source? They always call it the source. It's the same thing. What is it? The first thing you've got to get over, it's not a man. (laughs) They said, if anything, it would be a woman. Because a woman is the creative power. But it's neither. It has no sex. That's only the costume we're wearing here, this part we're playing on Earth. The God source is is a huge energy source. It is so powerful, it's unbelievable. That is where everything came from. It's total love. It has no sex. It has no definition. They told me, I think it was in the book Between Death and Life, when I first asked about God back when I wrote that book about 15 years ago, they said, the God is the glue that holds everything together. If it were to wink out for a fraction of a second, everything would disappear. It's so powerful. But they said, your concept of God is like a tiny thread compared to what it really is. You have no concept, you can't understand it. Then they said, imagine those people who are not even into this. Their concept of God isn't even like a tiny thread. They have no idea of what it is. Because the church still has it as a being, sitting up there on a throne, punishing people. It is a huge, powerful energy source that is tremendous. We all came from that. And it's a totally different way. You imagine people not wanting to leave that. Especially the ones that are sent down here now, and they're coming into this. They call it the muck and the mire. (laughs) 
They said it's like a ply, be caught on ply paper, and they don't like it. At the, you know, I told you the other day, when you come in, all the memories are erased, so you don't remember this. Imagine the confusion it causes. But let me go back to the beginning and explain how you all started out, and then I think you'll understand it a little better. Okay, in the beginning, we were all part of the source. We were all part of God. Everybody came from the same place. I have people coming in with their list of questions. Where did I come from? And so we all came from the same place at the same time. They think they came from another planet or what was their home? We all started out, home is God. It's the source. This huge, loving, total energy. So they, that's where we all began, in total love. And when I'm speaking to people when they're there, they don't want to leave. It is so total beautiful. And when they have to separate and leave, it is a feeling of separation, of loneliness, that I, don't, I want to go back. That's the feeling of wanting to go home. So we have all experienced that. Because in the very beginning, this was this huge, huge energy source. And my new books, they're telling me there was more before that, but I'm not going to go into that <laughs> right now. It gets very, very confusing. That's what they keep saying, there is more. But anyway, we all began as this huge energy source that was God. He wanted to explore. He wanted to learn. So he exploded out. That's what is called the Big Bang Theory. He exploded out, and all these particles and sparks flew out in all directions. Some of these sparks became galaxies. Some became planets. Many, many of them became the individual souls. When you take you back to what you really, really are, you're only a tiny, tiny spark. And the people see themselves as that. The soul, the real you, is a tiny, tiny spark that all flew out at the same time when God decided he, decided he wanted to explore. We all flew out at that time. And he says, go and learn. Learn as much as you can and bring it back. So that was the whole idea. We're sent out to explore, to learn, to learn lessons. That's what all the lives are about, what all the mistakes are about. Nothing is bad, nothing is good. It's all experiences. What do you learn from it? Everything we learn, we eventually take back. Somebody asked me the other day, when do we stop going? Well, you know, when this whole process starts. So. Everything in the universe is about accumulating knowledge and information. Everything is about it. The ETs are the same way. They are here to accumulate knowledge and to put it into their computer banks also. But we are here to learn everything we can possibly learn from every life imaginable. That's why you can't do it in one lifetime. That's why you have to have lives as ETs, other planets, energy beings. This is only one school. There are many, many other schools you have been to and you will go to. All of us have been on other planets and other dimensions. And when you get tired of this life here and you think you're finished, you may decide, okay, I'm going to go over to this other planet and see what it's like over there. It's all about exploring and learning more and more. And then we accumulate this and bring it back. In this way, we are cells in the body of God constantly learning information and transferring it back. So this is what I found out, that even if you go, don't go into the other lives on other planets and energy beings, when you come to Earth in Earth school, you have to be everything. This means everything. There's a whole section in the new book where I've had people go back to where they weren't human, I found out, I'm going to put it in linear order, even though I know now it doesn't happen that way. But, for instance, you begin, you have to be part of the air. And the first time I ever had that happen to somebody, 
and it's in a book that's out of print now, the one called Legacy from the Stars, a young man wanted to go back to the first life he'd ever lived on Earth. He went back to where he was, when Earth was forming, it hadn't had any life on it yet. There were volcanics, volcanoes erupting, there was ammonia in the air, and he was still forming to where plants, nothing had was here yet. So he was part of the atmosphere with many others, helping to clean the ammonia out of the atmosphere so that life could begin to form. So I kept thinking, here he's a chemical or whatever, and yet he's still communicating with me. So then I found out you have to know what everything is. So you have all done this, and then you have to know what it's like to be the dirt. What is it like to be a rock? I've had people be rocks. Everything is alive. Everything is energy. It's all just vibrating at different frequencies. And when I've had them be a rock, they'll say life is very slow. <laughs> Doesn't move very fast. And sometimes when they've gone through a life like that, it was tell them, it was teaching them to appreciate freedom. Because look how confining it would be to be a rock. And that's what they told me. So you have to learn all of these things, even if it's something simple like that. So then after you go through that, you have to know what it's like to be plants. And I've had many, many past lives where people were flowers, they were ears of corn, they were grass. And it's all, what did you learn by being that? Everything is alive. Everything has something to teach us. That's what we're trying. We, you know this, you can be more aware of nature, be more aware of your environment, and protect the environment more if you know you were all a part of it. Everything is a part of each other. And we're not separate. That makes a big difference. And then you have to know what it's like to be an animal. What would it be like to be a wolf and be able to run? What would it be like to be a bird and be able to fly? In the new book, I've got a whole section on life in other forms like this. All of it is teaching us something. Even if they just go through, I had somebody be a little yellow worm, you know. But it was teaching her something that she went through that lifetime. So we eventually get up to the part where we are human. Now in between there with the plants and the animals are the little people the fairies and the gnomes and the elves. They're very real. They are the keepers of nature. And we've all been those also. We all have to learn all the parts of all these things so we have it, and it's all in our memory. In one part of the book, they said, you must realize that even the dust of the earth is alive as a bird in flight. It's all alive. And we've all been it. We've all done it. But now we go into the humans. Okay, when you finally get to the human stage, what do you got to learn? Everything. Everything. <laughs> you have to be male and female many, many times. And when I say that, usually people, you know, I've had men say, wait a minute, I've always been a man. What do you mean? I've never been a woman. But what would you learn if you were only one sex forever? you would learn what it would be like to be the opposite. You wouldn't be balanced. So if you've been one sex too many times, then they'll say, okay, it's time to be the other one now to learn what it's like to be on the opposite. This, I've found, is one of the reasons for homosexuality. And it makes perfect sense. It's time to try the other role, and they don't feel comfortable with it. You hear men that say, I feel like I'm a woman trapped in a man's body because they're making this adjustment for the first time. So I had one man come up to me at a, at a lecture, and he said, finally, something that makes sense. But you have to be male and female many, many times. Then you have to be every race on earth. You have to live, be in every religion on earth. You have to live on every continent, every nationality on earth which can take a lot of lives. You have to know what it's all about and what it's like. If people understood the rules of reincarnation, there would be no prejudice. There would be no judging. 
because you would know you have been these religions or these races or you are going to be. If you're too judgmental, guess what you're going to come back as? The very thing that you were prejudiced against or the very thing you were judging. That's how karma works. And I've seen it time and time again in the sessions that I do. You have to be on the other side of the coin. That's how karma works. So if we knew that, we wouldn't be judging. We wouldn't be prejudiced. Of course, they said if everybody knew these things, there wouldn't be war, there wouldn't be violence. We would have, have heaven on earth if we could just understand this. This is where we're headed anyway, is to where it's all supposed to just end up eventually. But then you have to, you have to be everything. You have to be rich, you have to be poor, you have to be in every single situation that is possible to be before you're done. And she was asking me, when do you get finished? You can see it's a big thing. You can't do it in one lifetime. You can do many things in one lifetime, but you can't do it all. So we have to keep coming back and get it again until we get it right. And usually when I'm saying these things, some people in the audience look very uh, discouraged, you know. And I'll say, but I like to think when you get to this point, when you're asking questions and wanting to know more information, then I think you probably finished all these lessons and you're on your way out because you finally understand it. You're finally beginning to get it. But I like to think. (coughs) Especially with the new earth coming up. You don't want to think you're back here at the beginning with all of this stuff you have to learn. So all these different lifetimes, which would go on for, oh, millennia, you're going back and forth to the spirit side between each one, getting advice, getting, uh, looking at your next assignments, going back and forth. Finally, when you've got it all, then you can graduate. Don't have to come back to earth again. Don't have to come to any other lives again. Then you return to the source. You return to God. It's a full cycle. You begin there. When you've learned it all, you return. And then you download, I guess, into the gigantic computer everything that you have learned, and it becomes part of all of the knowledge that God is. And then some people will say, then what? You know? And that's when I asked him, what happens then? I said, what does God do with all of this knowledge and all of this information that is constantly being brought back to him? They said he uses it to create something else. Constant creation all the time. And so he uses what we bring back, all the experiences, all the knowledge, all of the problems, all of the heartaches, and he creates something else. And even the whole universe and everything is in a state of reincarnation because it's expanding out and out and out and out. And they've told me then after a certain time, it all comes back, like imploding back. Until it all, it may be, because they said the earth it accumulates information from everybody that lives on it. The sun accumulates information from all of the planets in the solar system. The other suns are doing the same thing. It's all communication devices. And they are all accumulating information from universes. You imagine the mass amount of information We're all like little parts of a gigantic computer. So then eventually it does it all and it becomes back, implodes back. And I said, then what happens? He said, then it it explodes out again. So it's a constant recycling of information. Does this sound discouraging to you? Because people say it begins to make more sense when you understand your part in the whole thing. But that's why there is no evil, there is no bad, no good. It's all experiences. And what did you learn from it? You didn't learn anything, you've got to do it again. Because you don't get out of it. You don't get out of this school, you can't skip a grade. You can have to repeat a grade. But then you finally get it all done and you go back and you dump it all. And they want to stay with that because it is so beautiful. But then they go out again. And I had one man in one of my classes say, 
Well, eventually, we should get to the point where there's nowhere else to go. You know, when can we just finally stop? We've gone to all the lifetimes. We've gone to all the planets. Then what happens then? Finally, you think you should be able to just stop. And the answer was, there's other universes. There's other, other dimensions. It's endless. In the new book, they told me about universes that obey other rules that we don't have here, where the planets are square. They're oval. They're triangle. They're moving in all kinds of weird orbits that we can't possibly imagine. And I said, but that doesn't obey the law of physics. They said it obeys the law of physics of that galaxy, of that universe. So it's beyond our comprehension. We think we know it all, and we don't. It keeps evolving out and out and out. So you can imagine what we have to learn. That's why they said we cannot possibly know it all. There's too much for our limited minds to know it all. They're giving us little bits and pieces because now they think we're at the time we can understand. Look where we were 30 years ago. We couldn't begin to understand any of this. So our minds are being opened to where we can understand it and accumulate more now. And the reason is because we're going into the new earth. (coughs) I'm going to try to leave some room here for questions. It took a little more time than I thought it was going to take. But it's, it's important information, I think. Okay. We have had civilizations upon civilizations all down through time who have destroyed themselves. Atlantis was not the only one. I have had people go back to lifetimes on many, many other civilizations before that. And the majority of the time, it was destroyed by man. I'm sorry to say this, guys, but you're the ones who usually cause the problems. (laughs) Women were always the ones who were the female energy, was always the ones trying to hold it together and keep it from happening. But in all of these civilizations, they would be given power, they would be given knowledge, they could do tremendous things with their minds, and they began to abuse it. It's like the guys would think, all right, I could do this with it, I could do that with it, and they began to abuse the privilege. And it was always the female energy who was trying to counteract this, and it was very, very difficult. So they would end up the civilization would be destroyed. And in the book, I talk about some that were destroyed by gigantic floods. Some of them were destroyed by uh, where the earth would move and it would be huge. Uh, debris and earth you know, would be dumped onto the cities and everything. But always, And they had one where the sun came through and burned a hole in the ozone layer because of the scientists were, po- were focusing on that. A lot of this stuff that we're doing now and it burned the earth, and it's what created the Sahara deserts and these parts that life has never formed again. But it was always the scientists playing around with things they shouldn't be playing around with. This has happened time and time again. And so they said, yep, every time we had to start all over again. And you had to burn like blowing a fuse. They couldn't allow us to have the knowledge back because we'd abused it, we'd gone too far. So we had to start all over again. Usually up again to the point where we're finally getting back to we're having the knowledge again. Now they said it's, it's too late. They don't want to do that. We're on the verge of destroying our world again. That's why these new souls are coming in. They said we don't want to start all over again. We don't want to have to begin again. So what they're doing now is they're creating the new earth that we can just go on instead of beginning again. Now the new earth, it says in the the Bible, in the book of Revelations, it's called the new heaven and the new earth. And it says in there some will be left and some will go. This is all part of it. It is very definite. It is real. And other ones talk about the thousand years of peace. It's going into a totally new thing. The old earth over here is the one that's having all the trauma. The earth is a living being. It's going through its own karma, its own trauma. It is 
getting having the uh, earthquakes, the tsunamis, all of this is to cleanse us, get rid of us, really. They said it's like a dog shaking the fleas off. <laughs> you know? But now some people, if they're not evolved enough, are going to be left with the old earth. You cannot move to the new earth until your frequency and vibration matches it. It's like everything, even when you go to the other side, side, your frequency and vibration has to match wherever you go. With the new earth, our frequency and vibration is being changed so that we'll be able to match the other earth. Uh, and it's differently in a di another dimension. I don't think there's time for me to explain dimensions, but I think you understand what they are. As I've had a lot of, I've written a lot about the different dimensions that are around us all the time. But it is a new earth that is being created to move into a new dimension. They, they said this has never happened before in the history of a planet, that an entire planet will move in mass to another dimension. I found other cases in the new book where civilizations have shifted into the new dimension. The Mayans were one, and the Anastasi out in uh, uh, New Mexico, I was just out there, some of these races totally disappeared, nobody knew where they went to. I've had regressions where people went to those times and were part of the ones that shifted. The whole civilization, like the Mayans, for instance, developed to the point to where they could do this. They raised their own frequency and vibration and decided to leave and go into the other dimension. They shifted in mass as a civilization. This is what the year 2012 has to do with the Mayan calendar because they were advanced enough that when they could see the next big thing that was going to occur was when the entire Earth would make the shift into the new dimension. And they put the date 2012 on it. And they keep telling me this does not mean time will end at that time. They said this means it will be a, a culmination of what's going on. This all began about the year 2003. And our bodies and the planet, everything has been shifting and adapting, changing frequency ever since. So by 2012, it should be at the point to where we're ready to cross over, if you want to say. Now, the effects on our body, we're feeling it more and more. Uh, they said the human body cannot shift in frequency and vibration quickly. It would destroy the body. It has to be done gradually. That's why I said these new children coming in are already adapted. They know they're already here. It's the rest of us. We have to do it in stages. Your body and frequency and vibration will shift then it will level out, then it will shift again, maybe several months. Well, we feel this in our body. And a lot of people are telling me they're going to the doctors, the doctors don't understand what's wrong with them, they put them on pills and things, but actually it's adjusting to the frequency vibration. Some of the main uh, symptoms that they're telling me, um, high blood pressure, heart palpitations, they have a lot of problems with the heart. AFib in the heart palpitations and the uh, blood pressure, depression, uh, aches and pains throughout the body, the muscles are aches and pains in the joints. This is as the body is changing in the frequency and adjusting to it. And uh, the entire body is being changed. They said the doctors are going from the old information that they've been taught. But the body is no longer that way. The cells in your body are constantly receiving new information. The DNA is being changed constantly. The doctors don't understand this. But this is what's causing these symptoms. You may go along for several months and not have any, and then it'll do it again. We're all becoming more and more sensitive to energy. You feel that. Because this is what's happening as we move. By the year 2012, it's supposed to be at the culmination when most of our bodies will be there. The ones who are not going, they cannot change their vibration and frequency fast enough. 
It can't be done that quickly. It has to be an ongoing, gradual process. Those will be left with the old earth. They said they will stay with what they have created. So that's why we have to change. We have to move on if we're going to be separating and moving out of this. Uh, and that's what they told me. The main thing you have to tell people, they said they must get rid of karma if you want to go on to the new earth. And believe me, it's beautiful. The, their descriptions they've given, it is beyond belief. And they said you cross over and you don't look back because you don't want to see what's happening behind you. But another thing that's happening, I'll get back to that part, another thing that's happening to us, our diets are changing. Do you notice that? Your diets are changing. They said you must get away from heavy meats. The body to become lighter, you have to eat lighter foods to raise it. The heavy foods hold you down, especially the meats, the red meats hold you down. You want to raise the body, the vibration, have lighter foods. They said the best foods are live foods. Live foods, they mean fresh fruits and vegetables. Organic, if you can get it. But the fresh fruits and vegetables are the best diet. Some chicken and fish, but they stay, stay away from the beef and the pork, especially because of what's being done to it at this time. But those kind of meats will hold you to the earth. You're supposed to be lightening. And you'll get to where you won't want to eat much. But you'll, it's um, fresh fruits and vegetables. You get away from the sugars. They said water is beyond comprehension, the value of water. But they said uh, eventually, as you notice, you're going to be going into all the liquid diets. You'll feel like that's what you want. So you'll notice the effects on your body. Your body's changing. Your diets are changing if you're paying attention to this. Time is speeding up. Everything's going faster. We're becoming more and more sensitive to energies. There's a lot happening if you're you're aware of it and paying attention to it. So the... um, They gave me an example, well, it was actually Annie Kirkwood. We were at a a conference, and we were on a panel. And she gave an example. You know, Annie Kirkwood was the one that wrote Mary's Message to the World. We used to do a lot of work together. She doesn't do it much anymore. But at the conference, she gave this example of what she saw. She said she was shown the Earth out in space. Then she saw it begin to pull apart like a cell begins to divide. And as she saw it begin to pull apart, she saw two earths. Over here on this one, she heard them saying, we did it, we did it, we did it. Over here on this one, she heard them saying, poor thing, she died believing all that. (laughs) See, one will not be aware of the other. Just like the Bible says, one will be taken, one will be left, and they won't even know the difference. So it's a very strange thing. And I've asked so many questions about this, trying to understand it. And they keep telling me, we can't give you all the answers because we don't know. This has never happened before in the history of a universe. That entire planet will make the shift. It's the greatest show on Earth, and everybody is out there watching it because they want to see what's going to happen. But uh, we're in the middle of it right now. And I've been trying to understand it more. They said, it won't be like all of a sudden you'll wake up one morning and everything is going to be different. It's going to be gradual. And you may not even be aware that you have moved. But all of these things that are happening right now is the earth getting rid of its karma with the tsunamis and everything like that. It's the old earth. And we are moving into the new earth, and it's going to be fantastic. I know I'm forgetting a lot of stuff there that I need to bring up, but uh, though they said the main thing, yes, in order to do this, you must get rid of karma. Otherwise, you're condemned to come back again and again, stay with the old earth until you work it out. And how do you get rid of karma? 
what's the easy, the quickest way, but not the easiest way to get rid of karma? Some people say, do it back to them. You do it back to them, all you do is keep the wheel moving. You don't resolve anything. And that's what I work with my counseling. You must forgive. you got to let it go. I tell them, tell the person. You don't have to tell them face to face. You do it mentally. With your mind. Even if the person is dead, you can still do it. Do it with your mind. You'll say, I know we had a contract. It was. It didn't work. We tried. We really tried. It didn't work. Now it's time to tear up the contract. You go your way with love, and I'm going my way. We don't need to be in this anymore at all. And you have to release them and really mean it. Because I've had clients, they'll say, I can't forgive them. You don't know what they did to me. Doesn't matter. We've got to the point that it does not matter anymore. So what if your mother or father mistreated you? That's then. We're moving on. So what if your husband was a jerk? So what if he did, what if he did cheat on you? What if he beat you up? What if he was an alcoholic? So what? That's then. You hold on to that. That's karma. You've got to release it. Let it go. Forgive him and move on. Otherwise, you're going to be stuck. They said, the main thing we've got to tell people is get rid of this junk. I call it the baggage in the garbage we carry around. We've got to get rid of it. Let it go. That's the most important thing right now. Another important thing they said you must get rid of is fear. You've got to get rid of fear. And look at the media does. Look at all these things they keep trying. They, they are trying to instill fear in you. They said, think for yourself. Don't get into the fear. Release the karma. Release the fear. Then you can move on. Those are the two most important things they told me to tell people. So we're moving into a totally new world, a totally new concept that you can't imagine. And it's it's going to be beautiful. So if you want to go, you've got some work to do. (laughs) Okay, we only got a... I'm going to go over a little bit if you have any questions. And then we're going to have the panel, and we'll have everybody up here, and you can ask questions to everybody. Okay, where's the microphones? Right there. Okay. Okay, here's one here. Okay. <laughs>